for the opportunity once again to just be in the presence of the Lord. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. There's no better place to be than here, and there's no better time to be here than now. This is where the blessing is, amen? And as we've gathered together to celebrate Jesus Christ and to celebrate the tremendous sacrifice that he paid the price for us to be redeemed today, we, we are, we're just overwhelmingly grateful. If it had not been for the Lord, where would we be today? He's the reason we're here. It's in him we live. It's in him we move. It's in him we have our identity or being. He is absolutely our reason for life itself. Because before Christ, you only exist. It is only in him that you live because he is the way, the truth, and the life. So outside of him is existence. In Christ is life and abundant life on top of that. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll be reading from the 23rd verse. I encourage you to bring your own Bible. Leave the uh, house Bibles for the visitors, but you should always carry your own sword with you everywhere you go. Soldiers don't go to war without their weapon, isn't that right? And every day we are contending for the faith in the battlefield of life. We should carry our sword with us every place we go. So that at any time it is necessary for us to give a defense, we have our weapon primed and ready. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at the 23rd verse. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he took the cup, and when he supped, he said, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and uh, drink this cup, you show the Lord's death until he comes. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that drinks and eats unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak, and it goes on to say that many are sickly and have fallen asleep. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege and for the opportunity that's been given to us to be in the house of God this morning. We thank you for your presence, evident in our midst. We know you're here. You said in, in your word, if two or three people gather together in your name, you promise to be there. Amen. We've met the mandate. We've celebrated you thus far, and we are confident that you are still here to minister to the many needs, the multitude of needs that are represented in the hearts and lives of your people. As the word goes forth, quicken it to our ears to hear to our hearts to receive and to our will to be subject to yours in obedience. Make of us the mighty nation that you've called us to be so that we will be victorious in the battles of life. Encourage those who are discouraged, strengthen those who are weak, give direction to those who seek it. And if perchance someone here does not know you, it is our prayer that they will come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the end result, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. From the words of our text and from the life that we live, I have concluded as I've examined uh, life on the short fall and the long fall that many times we do a lot of things in life and we seldom even stop to ask why. We are basically creatures of habit. When we become part of organizations and fellowships, we assimilate and we go through the process of conforming to what is expected and required of us and oft times we don't even ask the question why. Why is a very important question, because why gives life to our, our, our actions and, and uh, our outpourings? When you know why you do it, you, 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 you put a certain level of sincerity and commitment behind it that does not exist when you just follow the crowd. Have you ever noticed that in your own life? The minute you have a knowledge as to why things are to be done or why things are being done, it takes on an altogether new meaning. And we should know exactly what happens when we come to church and why we do the things we do. That is why I've gotten, in, in, in these later years of my life, I'm not talking like an old person, I'm just talking about somebody who's been around for a while. 
But in these later periods of my life, I often wonder why we conform to whatever we are told to do. When we're told to clap or say this or say that, we just go along with the program and say it. And half the time, we don't even believe what we're saying. We're just doing it to uh, affirm what the person has asked us to do. But I'm confident that when you know what you're supposed to do and you know what is expected of you by the Lord, then it makes what people give you as an instruction much easier and much more palatable to understand when it comes in alignment with what God has established in his word. Amen? Amen. We develop habits and we develop traditions, and many times if we're not careful, we even forget why we do certain things. You can do something for so long you forget why, you just do. But you should always know why you come to church. You should know why you worship. You should know what the object of your worship is. When we come to the Lord's table, you should know what the communion is all about and what's expected of you as you participate in it. And it should be done freely, it should be done knowledgeably, and it should be done from the heart so that God is glorified. Amen? Amen. So the question is, why do we celebrate communion? Well, we just read in the scripture what it tells us to do. The first reason is that uh, we have a meal together and we look back and remember what Jesus Christ did for us. The Bible says on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, and after he gave thanks, he gave it to them. And he took the wine, and after he gave thanks, he gave it to them and told them to eat and to drink and participate in this communion in this supper together in this Eucharist and he said as often as you do this you do it in remembrance of me so the communion calls us to remember and what do we remember just that Jesus gave it to his disciples I think if we were to be honest with ourselves part of the remembrance process has to do with the fact of what Jesus did for us I can't speak for you and you can't speak for me but I know this there was a time in my life when I did not know him as my savior you know, it, it's, it's not the, it, it is the best thing, and yet it's not the best thing to be raised in the church all your life. Because if you've been raised in church all your life, you have a certain sense of in, enablement and empowerment that, that is not authentic. And the reason it's not authentic is because you got it from your mother, from your father, your grandmother, whoever brought you to church, but you don't have it for yourself. We are to know who we are, and we are to know whose we are. And we're to walk in the authority of the believer knowing that Jesus Christ went to Calvary for me. I look back to Calvary and I put my name on that cross and I say, Jesus went all the way to Calvary. He suffered, he bled, and he died so that I today could know the joy of having my sins forgiven. Amen? Amen. When I consider this, I recognize that Jesus was interpreting the Passover that had taken place in the book of Exodus with Israel as they were getting ready to come out of Egypt and on their way to the promise of God. There were ten plagues that God visited upon the nation of Egypt. And the 10th plague was the most severe of them. The 10th plague was when the angel of death would hover over Egypt and Goshen and take the firstborn of every household. But it was not the will of God that Israel should suffer like the Egyptians were going to have to suffer. So he gave them instruction, divine instruction. Whenever God gives you a divine set of instructions, it is incumbent upon you to follow it. Because if you don't follow the instructions that God has given, then the results that God promises don't belong to you. If you're going to receive what God promises, you've got to follow God's instruction. Can I get a witness on that? Yeah. Amen. So the instruction was for them to prepare for a Passover feast. They were told exactly what to do, what kind of lamb to pick. They were to pick an animal that was without blemish or spot, had a good disposition. They had to feed it for a period of time before the sacrifice. In other, wor other words, that lamb had to be ready to die for the purpose for which it was even born. And after that, they were also given instruction as to the bread, they could not eat bread that had yeast in it because it was to be a hasty meal and they could not give the yeast an opportunity to rise. So they ate what is called the unleavened bread. It's like the matzah of today. Stick it in the oven, bake it real quick, and when it comes out, it's ready to be consumed. They were also given the wine to drink and they were told to put their clothes on, put the staves in their hands, put the sandals on their feet, gird themselves with their belts, and be ready for a hasty departure. You see, there are times when God is getting ready to do something quick. And the preparation time that we would take to get the job done can cause us to miss what God's trying to do. You know, that's why I believe the rapture is going to be beyond our control. Because some of us would have to go to the barber shop. Lord, don't come yet. I got to go get my weave. Lord, just give me a little bit of time. I got to, no, no. It's going to come so suddenly. Some of you in the midst of, of a weave job will be snatched out of the chair and ushered into eternity. It's beyond our control, and it has to be that way. Because when God gets ready to do something, he does not want the delay of mankind waiting upon themselves to finish their thing before they do God's will. Do you understand where I'm coming from? So God did not want Israel to get ready for departure. He told them to get ready 
in advance of departure so that when the death angel would come across the land and death would overtake the nation, they would be prepared at the instruction of Moses, which he got from Pharaoh to get out of town. They were ready to go, ready to move at a moment's notice. We need to remember what the Lord has done for us. For some of us, if he hadn't snatched us when we did, when he did, we wouldn't be here today. Some of us were at the very door of death itself. Satan had us in his grip and was ready to take our lives. And the Lord said, flee. And we listened to the voice of God and fled the city of destruction. And today we are in the arms of Jesus, safe and sound. What a blessing. But we have to look back and remember. And the communion offers us the opportunity to look back all the way to Calvary and beyond Calvary to the Old Testament encounter with Israel. But when we look back to Calvary, we recognize recognize that he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed and the first healing is the greatest healing of all healing from the sickness of sin itself and giving us a new life a life worth living a life that is filled with possibility and potential because we know today if God is for us who can be against us sometimes we need to just sit down and remember sit down and look back and see where God brought us from and realize we didn't get here on our own. You know, some of us think we've arrived at where we are today all by ourselves. We think we're so wise and so cunning and so ingenious and so smart and so well-connected that we could have gotten here all by ourselves. But I'm here to remind you today, if, if it had not been for the Lord on your side, you wouldn't be here today, not for one minute. Because the Bible says we were born in sin, shaped in iniquity. We always did what seemed right to us. But according to the Word of God, what seems right to us is the way of death. We have to know what is right according to the will of God and the work of God so that we can enjoy the blessing and the presence of God in and upon our lives. Amen? Amen. So take a few moments and look back. Remember who you were. Remember what you were. Remember where you were headed until you had a divine encounter with Jesus. And what he did for you is he turned everything around. I hear people often talk about a turnaround as being a 360-degree rotation. But if you do a 360, you're back where you started. We have to do a 180. We are going in the opposite direction. We are climbing the heights of God now rather than living in the doldrums of sin. If any man be in Christ, he is what? A new creation. And a new creation means that the old has gone and the new has come. And in order for us to fully appreciate it, we need to look back and see just where God brought us from. Sometimes to look back will bring tears to our eyes. Sometimes it will sadden us to realize that we lived in sin for so long before we came to Jesus especially those who heard the gospel in their youth. They wait until they're mature and old to get saved. You look at those years as wasted lives, life years. But let me tell you, no time is wasted when you come to Christ. They're all times of preparation for what God is going to do in your life in the here and in the now. If you've ever experienced any setbacks, disappointments, things that you hadn't anticipated, you lived in the, in the doldrums of sin, don't, don't look at it as wasted years. Learn from the experiences of yesterday. Invest in those experiences and make them stepping stones to tomorrow's success. So what I mean is look back on it. Don't trip over it again. I'll never be anything because of yesterday. The devil is a liar. What I've went through yesterday is only to prepare me for where God is taking me today and tomorrow. And if it had not been for the lessons that I've learned in life, I wouldn't be here today where I am. It's the lessons I've learned that have made me the person God would have me to be. Can you make that testimony as well? So we look back and see where God brought us from. But not only do we look back and uh, remember, but we also begin to rejoice. Because he said in the 26th verse, whenever you eat this bread and uh, drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We rejoice in the fact that we don't serve a dead Savior. We serve a risen, living Savior. All of the other great world religions can take you to the cemeteries where their founders are buried. They will show you the mausoleums and the mosques and the grottos that have been carved into the earth. And they say, this is where the founder of this great religion was buried. But today, we can't take you any place on this earth and show you where Jesus is. We can show you where he was, but we know today he sits at the right hand of the Father. He is my intercessor. When I get in trouble, I've got an advocate in heaven who pleads my case before the court of justice. And instead of me falling victim to my past, he gives me an opportunity to have another opportunity to say it's in him I live and it's in him I move and it's in him I have being or identity. Because the Bible I read says, if I confess my sins, he is faithful and he is just 
to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. If that's all I have to go on, that's enough to make me rejoice each and every day. It's enough to make me celebrate Jesus Christ, for he paid the price for me so that I could go forward and live for him and give him the best of my life. Amen? Amen. We're not just looking back, but we're pointing forward as well when we rejoice. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We have the assurance of knowing that he's coming back again one day. Now, the sad thing about the Lord's delay in return is that every day he delays, we think he's not coming. We actually have deceived ourselves and lulled ourselves into a false sense of security, thinking that he's not showing up at all. But just as sure as you live, he's coming back again. He declared it in his word, and he's not a man that he should lie. So we've got to get ready, and we've got to stay ready. We've got to be prepared, as Israel was, for the flight out of Egypt. We've got to be ready at a moment's notice, because the Bible tells me when he comes, he's coming as what? A thief in the night. No man knows the day or the hour. And because of the, of the suddenness of his return, we have to always be ready. Now, it's not possible for you to be ready by yourself. You need divine assistance if you're going to be ready. And I'm thankful that he's given us goodness and mercy. He's given us the angels of the Lord that encamp around about us. He's given us the power of his Holy Spirit to enable us to get ready and to stay ready. And if we are staying ready, we have good reason to rejoice each and every day. Because I can say, he died for me. You can say it for yourself. He died for me, and I'm thankful that he took my place. Because if he had not taken my place, somewhere along these years of life that I have lived already, it would be too late for me. I might not be able to afford the sacrifice to bring. It would be too late for me. But I'm thankful that he paid the price completely for me. I rejoice in that fact. I rejoice in the fact that he paid the price and made it possible for me today to say I'm a son of God. When you talk to some people about salvation, they tell you they go to church. I didn't ask you if you went to church. I asked you, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord? And said, well, well, Reverend, I go to church. That's not the answer to the question. Because hell will be full of good church people. People who went to church but didn't surrender their lives to Jesus. It's about a personal relationship and a personal commitment with Jesus Christ. And you know what's unique about it? He does for me what is unique to my experience. He does for you what is unique to your experience. And he does for us what we could not possibly do for ourselves. So we celebrate and rejoice today. When you get up every morning, you should rejoice that you got up clothed and in your right mind. You should celebrate the fact that he kept you through the night. Because there are some people who went to sleep last night who got up in the morning and didn't know who they were. And when you wake up in the morning, look in the mirror and know who you're looking at, it's time to rejoice. When you put your clothes on and leave the house to go to work, it's time to rejoice. When you get to work safely, it's time to rejoice. When you get back on the train to go home at the end of work, it's time to rejoice. When you get back into your house at the end of your journey, it's time to rejoice. When you sit down and eat a meal, it's time to rejoice. And we don't rejoice that our money is in the bank. We rejoice that God kept us and protected us throughout the day and gave us safe passage to and from our various destinations and has given us reason to rejoice. You know, you can be broken and rejoice. You can be sick and rejoice. You can be friendless and rejoice. You can be at odds with this world and still rejoice. Because we should be at odds with this world because the, the world is, is not our friend. And if we march to the beat of its drum, we're not children of God as we ought to be. I don't rejoice in the fact that I'm broke, but I, I rejoice in the fact that he shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory. I, I, I don't uh, rejoice over the fact that I'm sick, but with his stripes I'm made, he I'm, I'm, I'm made well. He heals me. I don't rejoice about my problem, but I rejoice about the fact that with my problem I still have Jesus. And one songwriter said, I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Because if I have Jesus, I have all that is necessary to live the abundant life that Christ has called me to live. Amen? Amen. So when we look back to Calvary and when we look at Calvary, we have good reason to be thankful and remember what he did for us. We have good reason to also rejoice in the God of our salvation. And somewhere in the midst of this purpose and plan, we also have an opportunity to take a good look at ourselves and do some repenting. We think from the day we got saved, we did all the repenting we need to do. But if we're honest with ourselves, we need to repent every day for something. Verse 27 said, if we eat the bread or drink the cup in an unworthy manner, we're guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. It says we ought to examine ourselves before we eat and before we drink to make sure that things are right. When we repent, we repent not only for 
uh, the things of yesterday, but we repent even for the things of this day. You know, they're not just sins that we commit. They're things that we omit that create sinful conditions in our lives as well. And we need to pray for the things that we've done and the things that we've thought and the things that we did not do. It could be as simple as not fasting when the Lord calls you to turn your plate down. It could be as simple as not reading more of the scripture when the Lord tells you it's time to study my word. Turn off your television, but your show is coming on. Has the Lord ever interrupted your show plans? You're getting ready to watch your program, and the Lord says, now you need to spend some time with me. You say, Lord, when we're through watching television, we'll, we'll, we'll pray. That's the trick of the enemy. You know why? Because when you finish with television, you fall asleep. I've often said the best way for the devil to put you uh, uh, to, to uh, how, how did I put it? The best way for the devil to get you where he wants you and to keep you carnal is to leave you alone when you're tired and you want to pray because you'll fall asleep. He'll keep you awake to do what he wants you to do. Then when it's time for you to read your Bible, pray, seek the face of God, consecrate, fast, or whatever, he gives you a disposition that is totally contrary and you do what you're doing with immunity, feeling that God understands. But I want you to know, the only thing he understands is how where our hearts are concerning what his command is for our lives. And uh, if you look back on your life, even over the past week, I am certain there are reasons that the Lord has given you to come to him and ask him for forgiveness. It could be your attitude. Some of us have real bad attitudes. Did you know that? Saints. You might have to drop the S.A., Ain'ts. For those of you who are a little bit slow, just drop the SA. <laughs> there are times when we don't operate from a saintly posture. And if the world would look upon us, they would say, we ain't saints. But to be a child of God is to have a godly disposition in the midst of everything we go through. And there are times you catch yourself and you realize that I'm not where I should be. I'm not operating from the paradigm of God's presence and God's power and his correction in my life. I'm doing my thing. And if we catch ourselves doing our thing, how many of you, uh, be honest, please, how many of you have caught yourselves out there doing your thing rather than God's thing? At least once. Don't get deep now. You weren't born this way. At least once. Raise your hand. That's why we have to continually pray. That's why we have to continually ask the Lord to cleanse us and to wash us and to regenerate us and to forgive us. That's why we examine ourselves each and every day. Self-examination can spare us the judgment of God which will befall us if we don't walk the life that God has called us to walk. He wants us to have clean hands and pure hearts. Isn't that right? How many times have you participated in the communion with dirty hands and with a heart that is not inclined toward the things of God? There comes a time in your life, saints of God, when you have to deny yourself the due process of being a child of God until you get it together and then go through the process with the right hand and the right heart. Do you know what I'm talking about? Because in church, we front... We become what people think we are to impress them. And we do things that we shouldn't be doing because we know we're not right with God. Well, it's time for us to get it right so that God will not hold us accountable for the things that we've done purporting to be right when we know we're not. So it's a time of uh, confession. It's a time of uh, response. It's a time of uh, uh, asking God to have mercy upon us and repent from the things that we know we shouldn't be doing. And repentance is not always action. Many times we need a cleansed mind. We need a cleansed mind. Because you know what your mind is? It's a playground for Satan if it's not consecrated. You have to be careful what you entertain. Because what you entertain, you begin to practice in some way. You practice it and rehearse it in your mind, and then if given an opportunity to op operate from a fleshly perspective, you find yourself doing things that you know you shouldn't be doing. And you can be as quiet as you want. I know I'm not the only person who, who has these challenges. If you live righteous, the Bible says you will suffer persecution. And the persecution is for you to be tempted to do something knowing you shouldn't do it, but be tempted anyhow to do it and be inclined in that direction. That's the persecution of Satan that, that, that wants to dethrone you from the place that God has established for your life. And to be honest with ourselves, we have to be honest with God. We're not honest with ourselves, and it makes it difficult for us to be honest with God because we actually can tell ourselves that everything is right when we know it's jacked up. And we walk in self-deception, believing that all is well with us and all is well between us and God and everybody else. And we know good and well things are not the way they ought to be. So we have an opportunity to be honest when God shows us ourselves in the word of God. And the scripture says before we come to the table, we need to do self-examination. It's no time for me to be looking at you and wondering why you're up here. I know all about your business. I'm so busy trying to get myself right, I don't have time to look at you. 
And you should be so busy getting yourself right, you don't have time to look at me. And at the end of our self-examination, you know what our song should be? It's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And we should be so contrite before God that we get it right on the spot. Some of us think we can wait till next Sunday. Next Sunday, there's no promise. There's no guarantees that we'll ever see the rising of another sun from this day forward. So if we have a chance to get it right, we're to get it right and make sure that all is well between our soul and our Savior. We cannot allow ourselves to be caught in situations and circumstances that will cause us to be compromised in our determination to have a right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And the sharing of the communion gives us an opportunity to examine ourselves. If the Holy Spirit shines his light on anything in your life that is unworthy of the body and blood of Jesus, we should have the opportunity to repent of it and to experience his forgiveness and cleansing so that when we come to the table, we can celebrate worthy. Amen? Amen? And worthy is what God wants of all of us. He wants us to be well done, good, and faithful servants. And in order for that to happen, we have to walk worthy of the call and the volition that God has on our lives. And because God wants all of us to be used for his glory and for his honor, we have to make sure that we don't allow anything to come between us and our Savior. When we've uh, properly repented, the next thing that happens is reconciliation. When we come to the Lord's table, we are reconciled with God. And as those who have been reconciled, we understand clearly that God has a, a purpose for our lives that can only be executed when we are in step with him. We march to the beat of his drum. If a person eats and drinks unworthy, he does so with no reverence and no sense of the importance or the obligation of their act when it comes down to the reverence before the Lord. We have to make sure that we understand that the body of Christ that it talks about is not the building, but we are the body of Christ, the church. And we have to be right before God when we come each and every time. Do you understand what I'm saying? We cannot be at odds with our brother. Some of us have no problem taking communion and hating the folk around us. We got no problems with that whatsoever. Came to church not talking to folk. Worship not talking to folk. Break bread and don't talk to folk. And act like, why did they even show up at church? Why did you come? You have to make sure you're right with God, that your heart is right with God. You can't be at odds. If your heart finds itself difficult to love people, if you hate folks, if you harbor bitterness in your heart, if you have contempt against your brethren, then it has no business coming to the Lord's table until these offenses have been rectified. We have to make sure that there's nothing that stands between our soul and our Savior. So if I don't like you before I take the juice, before I take the bread, I should come to you and say, I'm sorry. I should purpose it within my heart to get it right because if I can't get it right with you, what makes me think God will allow me to get it right with him? When the word of God says he doesn't even hear my prayer if I harbor iniquity in my heart. Some of us have so much iniquity toward others in our hearts that we wonder if God ever heard our prayer to begin with. Let's understand the importance of reconciling. And let's be reconciled one to another. Because it's only through reconciliation that we have an opportunity to be used by God and for God to be glorified in the life that we live. Amen? Amen. When we walk together in harmony, even though we have reason to disagree, it says to the devil, you lost this group. You lost these individuals. Because the devil wants to keep us at odds with each other because he's the author of what? Confusion. But the God we profess to serve is not the author of confusion, so we should be united. Now, it doesn't mean we have to agree on everything, but it means we have to love everybody. If you don't agree with me, you're not my friend. Well, then something's wrong with the way you structure friendship. Because friendships are not all about you. It's about us working together to achieve a common good. And if it's all about us, then we should lay aside our differences and be one in Christ so that God is glorified in everything that we do. Amen? Amen. If we want God to be glorified, when we come to the table, it cannot be a ritual. It cannot simply be a practice or a discipline we enter into. It cannot simply be something we do because it's the first Sunday of the month. If we're really are going to have meaning to it, we have to remember the tremendous price that Jesus paid to redeem us from sin. We have to rejoice in the fact that he did for us what we could not possibly do for ourselves. We have to repent of our stiff-neckedness, of our rebellion, of our hard-heartedness, and of the things that drive us away from him and him away from us. And then we've got to be reconciled to God, and we've got to be reconciled to one another. Because if we are reconciled to God, evidence of it is that when we love one another again, as Christ has loved us and given himself for us. How can you be reconciled to God and be at odds with God's family? We have to be one in Christ. Can I get some help? Please, give me some help. And if that is the reality, then we have to lay aside our differences and our distinctions and come to the Lord Jesus Christ and understand that we celebrate and we commemorate the Lord's table because of these four distinctives, what he did for us and what we could not possibly do for ourselves. 
What can wash away my sin? What can make me whole again? And the songwriter said, Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. It speaks of the cleansing. No other power I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What a blessing to know that he did for us what we could not do for ourselves. When we were in sin and bold about it, he had mercy upon us. Can you imagine what would have happened if he had struck you down in the midst of your folly? We wouldn't be here today. But he had mercy on us. And I'm thankful that he has mercy on us because sometimes we don't have enough sense to know what's right. We operate with a sense of uh, immunity from truth. But the truth is the soul that sins will die. And if we're going to be righteous people, we've got to be born again. We've got to come to Jesus just as we are. Be cleansed in the blood that Jesus uh, shed for us. And then walk in the newness of life, listening to the Spirit lead us step by step. And that is why we need to have the Holy Spirit manifesting himself in our lives because he's the voice of God that speaks to us. The word is the voice of God that speaks to us and lets us know what we should be doing. You know, when you don't want to do right, you don't like to read your Bible. Did you ever notice that? When you don't want to do the right thing, you put the Bible on the shelf, you stick it under, you put it in a drawer somewhere, you put it on the mantle and you don't look at it. When you don't want to do what's right, you come to church, church haphazardly. You don't come consistently. You come late and you leave early. When you don't want to do what's right, you don't hang out with godly saints. You hang out with carnal people just like you because they give you license to do what you want to do. There comes a time when you realize, if I hang out with them, I'm going to end up in the wrong situation, the wrong circumstance, the wrong conclusion in life. So I've got to choose new friends. I've got to choose a new walk. I've got to choose a new determination. I've got to come to church whether I feel like it or not. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. There are some Sundays I don't even feel like coming to church. <laughs> I wake up in the morning, and the clock hits me at 4.30, 5 o'clock. I say, oh, God, I've got to go to church this morning. I don't want to go to church. I'm being honest. And I'll go one better than that. It's a Sunday sometime when I have to preach. I don't want to come to church and I got to preach. I got to feed you and I don't even want to feed myself. I wish I could just stay home and stay in bed. But you know what I do? I get on my knees and I say, God, you have to fit me for this part of my journey. You know my heart and you know what I want to do and you know what I need to do and I know what I need to do and I know what I don't want to do. So I'm going to ask you to fit me for it. Give me some joy. Give me some peace. Give me some hunger. Give me some thirst. Let me come to the house of God and enter with thanksgiving and enter with praise. Let me declare with my own mouth, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice. So when I come to church, I come ready. And you know what? By the time I'm ready to speak, I'm excited for the opportunity that God has given me. Now, if I came to church and I had the bad attitude, I couldn't even preach to you. I'd be preaching at you. There's a difference to being preached to and preached at. That's when you come with all the condemnation. Ain't nobody here living right. Do this, do that. Because I'm not right. But if I give ch God a chance to get me right, when I get here, it's going to be all right. And my purpose is to encourage you to be all that you can be so that God is glorified. You don't always feel like doing the right thing, but do it anyhow. You don't always feel like being around the right people, but be around them anyhow. You don't always feel like reading your Bible, but read it anyhow. You don't always feel like praying, but pray through until you get your answer. You don't feel like fasting, but if the Lord says turn your plate down, turn it down. You don't feel like not watching your program, but if the Lord says turn off the TV, turn it off. You don't feel like abandoning some people who you think are your friends, but if the Lord says, leave them alone, leave them alone. You have to listen to the voice of God so that God can be well pleased with your life and bless you. So that when you come to the Lord's table, you don't have to constantly be getting it together. You got it together once and for all. You walk by faith and not by sight. And God is blessing you each and every day because you walk in submission and surrender to his will and to his divine purpose. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads for just a minute. As we bow our heads, there's someone here today, perchance, who does not have a relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord of their life. You're living in sin, and sin is simply disobedience. It's simply missing the mark of God by being disobedient to what God has spoken. If you're here today and that's who you are, I want to give you an opportunity to do something about it. What do I want you to do? I want you to be judgment day honest with yourself. To be that kind of honest, you have to answer the right questions in the right way. And the first question I ask is, are you ready to meet God face to face? If you were to leave this earth today and go from earth to eternity, are you prepared to stand before God and have him say, well done, 
Or would he say to you, I don't know you, depart from me, you're a worker of iniquity. If you don't have the guarantee and the assurance that he would receive you into his arms and into his rest, you can do something about it right here and right now today. What am I asking you to do? Am I asking you to join the church? Absolutely not. You're not saved because you go to church or join the church. You're saved because you come to Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. So this is not a call to right-hand fellowship. This is a call to discipleship, and each one must answer for themselves. If you're here today and you're not prepared to meet God in the judgment, would you be honest and say, please pray for me by raising your hand? All I'll do is pray, and I'll believe God for the rest of what he wants to do. Is anybody here today who's going to be honest enough to say, please pray for me? I want to be saved. I want to be a child of God. I want to know that I'm forgiven, that I'm cleansed, and that I'm prepared to meet God one day face to face. Is there anybody here who will make that declaration by raising their hand anywhere in the house of God? Please pray for me. I'm not right with God, but I want to get it right. Are there any backsliders here, people who once had fellowship and relationship with the Lord, but you walked away from the grace of God, and in doing so, you opened the door for Satan to deceive you and to snatch you back into sin. But today you say, I want to get it together. I want to do what's right. I'm coming back to Christ and asking him once again to forgive me and cleanse me and make me his child. Is that you? Would you raise your hand? All I'm doing is praying for you. That's all. Nothing more than praying for you. But I'm believing God to do what only God can do, and that is forgive and cleanse and make you his child. This is my last invitation. I'm not going to belabor you with this issue. If you're not saved, if you're a backslider, you want to come to Christ. You're not sure of your salvation. You, you, you can't say unequivocally that you're a child of God. You think you are sometimes, and other times you don't know. You want to be absolutely certain. If you fit into either of these categories, would you raise your hand and say, please pray for me? I need the certainty of my walk. I need to rededicate my life. I need to come to him for the first time. Either one, slip your hand up and say, pray for me. I want God to do something special in my life in this place today. I'm not leaving like I came. I'm coming to Jesus. If you're here, this is your final, final opportunity. Would you raise your hand? We'll pray for you, and the Holy Spirit will do the rest of the work. And if you're downstairs and the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, someone is waiting downstairs for you to raise your hand so that they can minister to you even as we would right here in the sanctuary. Anyone at all? God bless you, my sister, under the balcony. I see your hand. Is there anybody else? Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your honesty and for your truthfulness. Is there anyone else, a second individual, who will say, please pray for me? We'll give you a moment. This is life's most important decision. It's the only one that will follow you throughout eternity. Every other decision ends at the grave. But this one you carry with you into your forever and forever and forever. Is there anybody else who will say, please pray for me? I want to be saved. I want to be changed and transformed. My sister, would you come forward and let me pray for you? Come on down for a minute. Let me pray for you. And as she comes, let's all stand together. If you know that you're not right with God, you know that things stand between your soul and your Savior, you're not prepared to stand before him in the judgment and hear him say, well done. I give you this final opportunity to do something about it. Would you remain standing as others take their seats? We'll pray for you, that's all. We'll pray for you and believe God. Take your seat if you know Christ. Remain standing if you don't. All right, we thank God for one honest individual. Let's pray for her and believe God for what he's going to do in her life. <laughs> Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you today for our sister who's been honest with herself and with you. I pray that you would deal with her in the manner in which she needs to be dealt with. Forgive her, cleanse her, give her a new heart, a new determination reinforce the values that she knows to be correct, teach her how to walk as a child of God and live above the determination of this world to bring her to compromise. Let her say unequivocally, I have received him, affirmed him once again into my life, and I'm going to walk in the newness of the life of the believer, trusting God every step of the way. Do it for her as you've done it for us. We won't fail to praise you because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. My sister, if you step to the side for a moment, the altar worker is going to spend some time with you. Saints of God, we're getting ready to come to the Lord's table. But before we come, are there any people here who are facing any real challenges with uh, this kind of commitment? Just raise your hand and say, pray for me, that's all. Don't, don't, don't front now. If you, if you have some challenges and you know you do, just raise your hand and say, please pray for me. I need some strength. I need some guidance. I need some direction. I need some power so that I can overcome the challenges that I face every day that are keeping me on the ground when I should be soaring with the power of God. Heavenly Father, I thank you for honest people. 
who recognize their faults, their shortcomings, their dependence upon you. And as they reach out to you this morning, I pray that you would make of them the people you would have them to be. Give them the power of God through the intervening grace of the Holy Spirit to withstand the temptations and the wiles of the enemy. Help them to stand in a difficult place knowing that if God is for them, no one can be against them. And enable them to be more than conquerors because they put their faith, their confidence, and their trust in you. Help us to be a better people, a stronger people, a more viable people, a people who can bring glory and honor to your name because we walk in obedience and submission to the word and to the will of God. And as you do it for us, we will be eternally grateful. We ask it.